guys and welcome back to my channel. I'm Dolly Sir. <laughs> I know I spoke way too soon in the last video saying I'm on a roll <laughs> because I missed last week. But the reason I missed last week was because um, I was sick and I lost a bit of my voice. And even though I could talk a bit, I would if I talked for a long period of time, I would just start coughing. So with that being said, let's get to our next case that is in my little home that involves my little hometown is clear in the air i do not intend or mean any shade to anybody who's from here or anything like that um i'm just stating facts that i found and did my research on and um as well as i am letting you go go letting you guys know now that some of these descriptions of the crime are intense so if your discretion is advised there is involving sexual assault crimes against children and um <clears throat> gory like I said gory gory details so with that being said please don't judge me if I cry because I this really got to me so with that being said let's get to it Tommy Sells and his sister Tammy were both born in Oakland California of the year of 1964 on the 28th of June and his mom, um, Nina Sells, he, who was a single mother, five kids. So it was he and his sister, Tommy and, Nina, and Tammy, were the youngest. And um, so when they were both born, they ended up moving to, after they were born, um, they ended up moving to Lewis, um, Missouri. And soon right after, when they all moved, Sally, Tammy, and Tommy ended up contracting meningitis, which ended up killing his twin sister, Tammy, and with Tommy, you know, slowly making a recovery. And soon right after his recovery, he was sent to go live with one of his aunts that lived in Holcomb, Missouri. So I don't know how far it was, but it wasn't that far from where they originally lived. And um, later on, um, keep in mind, Nina, Tommy's mom, left left Tommy right after, like, when he came out from, you know, contracting um, meningitis. So it wasn't, he was maybe max two years old, and his mom didn't go back for him until he was five. And the only reason why Tommy's mom, Nina, went back was because Nina ended up finding out that, you know, Tommy's aunt was filing for custody for Tommy. And like, I, I get it. Like, why the fuck you're, why you, why you, why, why are you trying to drop my kid? But at the same time, it's like you dipped on your kid, you dropped him off, and you haven't seen him since it's two. So it's already been three years that she hasn't seen Tommy because she never visited Tommy. She never called to ask how Tommy was doing or offer any help. Like, hey, does he need A, B, and C? No, none of that. So obviously his aunt was like, okay, I take that as maybe she doesn't want Tommy anymore, you know, maybe because of what happened. Maybe it was a reminder that she lost Tammy. But no, she just... <laughs> didn't want to deal with Tommy, you know? And it wasn't anything negative at the moment yet. Anything negative about Tommy yet. And obviously this accept, like, pissed her off. It pissed off Nina. And and she went to go pick him up. So as he was growing up, he was mostly left alone to fend for himself. Like, he was just given the bare necessities. Okay, he got clothes, food, shelter, a home to live in. You know, just that. But he never really he never really got i guess the affection that he was wanting really from his mom and he just you know didn't really kind of just moved on from it like he didn't need it and after that he he would rarely as he was growing up he went to school he would really rarely now go to school you know he would go one day yes one day no one week yes one week no and then by the age of seven he beat me on that god damn by the age of seven he started becoming an alcoholic he would drink he would steal from families um you know a little thing just to get you know have someone older buy him the liquor or steal the family's you know alcohol and obviously with drinking now, that got him into a lot of trouble. And it just turned for the worst when he turned eight because he... <sighs> there was a family friend that 
his mom really got along with. They got along really well. I don't know if they were those kind of, you know, friends that they were, you know, on the side or something. But they became really good friends with this man called Will, Will Willis Clark. And Willis Clark, um, Willis Clark claims that he was just there for the family, that he's never done any malicious things to the family, but Tommy would say otherwise. Tommy would quote on say or claim that Mr. Willis Clark would molest him. And not only that, but that the fact that Nina, Tommy's mom, would give permission to Mr. Willis Clark to molest him. And so obviously, I mean, if that's true, I mean, that's fucked up. Like, that's just fucked up. And well, with this, it just, if this is true, it just made him go even worse because now, now he wasn't only drinking, he was now also smoking pot. And by the time he was already 10, he, he just, he just got out of school. He was like, what's the point of me going if I'm just going to always stiff? Which, I mean... Did the schools ever freaking like threaten parents back in the day? Like if your kid doesn't go to school, we're gonna call the cops or send you to court. Because obviously it didn't work for that family because he just hardly showed up to school and then he just full blown out, like withdrew himself from school. So it's like, but anyways by the time he turned 13 that's when he started getting into more serious trouble uh it's gonna sound so fucked up that i say this but he ended up getting more into ser more serious trouble and by that um he would at times climb into bed climb into his grandmother's bed fully naked Now, I don't know about you, but that would have been a first sign for me to get my child some help, you know, like. You don't do that with grandma, sir. No, not even if it was your step grandma, you don't do that, like. But, <laughs> and um, this time around too, he ended up going, not going to jail, but he did get in trouble with law enforcement because at this time, he also assaulted his mom. And that apparently was the last straw for Nina. Like she knew that there was no going back after he, he put his hands on her. And like, it's understandably, you wanna give your child so many chances and stuff. But if what, if what Tommy claims is true, that you gave this stranger or your buddy buddy permission to violate your child, I mean, I don't condone and you know anybody going at their mom but i mean so after a couple of days passed after he assaulted his mom his mom literally just picked up the rest of the kids and decided to you know what i'm not doing any anything no more that was her last straw like i said and she literally just picked up the kids the rest of her kids and just left and he didn't, she didn't say nothing to him where they were going. She didn't leave him a letter. She didn't leave him nothing but an address, you know, to go back to. Because I think their house was already paid for. So she didn't go, she didn't go fuck. She didn't care that she was living in a house. She just wanted to get away from him. And so obviously, obviously that really, really pissed him off. And it pissed him off so much that that, that, that that same day, he ended up attacking a young girl by pistol whipping her until she was unconscious and sadly ended up sexually assaulting her. And so after that, fast forward, he would commit his first murder at the age of 16. And I couldn't find a lot of reports on this just because it's mostly that Tommy claims these kind of kind of things he he was trying to kind of build up his rapport and his backstory and he claimed that the age of 16 that's the first time that was the first time he killed and he ended up killing a man because um he broke into the man's house and ended up just beating him to death because he 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 quote unquote knew that this man was molesting children but like I 
like I said, there was no proof or evidence to back it up. It was just his claims. But again, that was like back in the day, you know, it wasn't really, it wasn't a safe, a safe time for sexual assault victims to come come out because i mean can you blame them the system was was shitty it was it sucked to ass it wasn't a great rapport for those sexually assaulted victims and um after that tommy drifted from place to place picking up odd jobs and just to make ends meet just to make his like necessities meaning food clothes hotel rooms and um it was just that he would just pick up oh, here sorry um he would just pick up odd jobs to do that put food on the table for himself nothing more not to build a career and anything but just to get by and um he did end up reuniting with his family but as soon as he did reunite with his family he right away tried um molesting a family trying he tried to rape a family member and obviously which like what the fuck <laughs> and right away he was you know like hey get the fuck out of here we don't want you here you already fucked up you know so he had to dip and when he left obviously he was left again to fend for himself back on the street alone with nothing but you know whatever he had on and after that he he started to commit a string of murders um burglaries robberies while he was still holding down holding down like small jobs small low skill jobs because remember he dropped out so he didn't have no degree no no ged no diploma so anything that was like common sense wise of a job he would get it and he he liked working for the carnivals and the fairs which worked perfectly for him since he he would go he wouldn't stay in one place for long you know he knew that they only stayed for a short period of time. I think the the carnivals and the fairs, some stay about less than a week, eight days to two weeks. And that's what he liked, that it wasn't long. He would go hunting and find the perfect victim for himself. On his last day or two, he would go and attack them. So after that, he 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 traveled back to Lewis, Missouri, and on in eight in 1983, he was arrested for theft, and he was given a two-year sentence where he didn't really serve it at all. He didn't really serve that fucking sentence at all because, um, if I do recall correctly, he he went in in 1983, but the endings of 1983, and then he got out in February of 1984. So he went again he he was out on probation but he didn't give a fuck he ended up joining the carnival again not caring that he had a report to probation where he went and he ended up meeting this lady you know in the tar touring with the carnival he ended up meeting this lady um miss edna court and her son rory court and um they were just, you know, she was a really good person, just trying to offer Tommy a place to stay, um, giving him a meal, you know, they were kind of hitting it off a bit, you know. And um, he left somewhere to go do something, and when he returned back, he found Enna going through his stuff, and he did not like that. He really did not like that. And he was just so heated and tan calentado that um, he ended up beating Miss Edna with the first thing that he saw, which was sadly a baseball bat. And after he was done beating her to death with it, um, Rory was in the next room asleep and he, he could have have left him alone. He could have just left, but he felt like he couldn't leave no one behind alive, you know, because I'm pretty sure, or I think that Rory saw him when his mom brought him to home and was he knew that Rory would say this man came with us and then my mom's dead so he just knew he couldn't leave a witness behind so then he ended up sadly beating little Rory while he was asleep with the baseball back a piece of fucking shit and three three days later the bodies were found by I think a friend or a neighbor and by that time Pinche Tommy Abolo, like he was already in another place, another state, and um, there was no witnesses. There wasn't, you know, any, no any forensics 
to run because at that time come on it was 1984 dna testing and all that shit wasn't at its peak yet sadly but <sighs> tommy ended up in prison again in missouri for crashing his car while drunk driving and his sentence lasts from september of 1984 all the way from all the way up to May 16th of 1986 and once he was released he was back on uh, back on his shit back on you know doing his dumb shit of killing people and um, he actually ended up in the hospital because once he got out he ended up getting an addiction to heroin and that sent him to the hospital because he accidentally overdosed so when Tommy left the hospital that was in Fremont, California, um, during this time, it was suspected that Tommy was responsible for the deaths of 20-year-old Jennifer Dewey and Michelle Xavier. And Jennifer was shot to death, and Michelle was found with her, cut, with her throat slit. And a year later, um, in 1997, Tommy murdered another 20-year-old named Stephanie Stroh, and he drugged her with LSD before strangling her and raping her, you know, her dead body. And once he was done with um, Stephanie, he ended up throwing her body in a hot spring in Winmuka, 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 Nevada. And so right now I'm gonna put a disclaimer. With this, it's gonna be nasty. It's gonna be very gruesome. It involves crimes against children. It involves gruesome details. It involves rape, sexual assault. So your discretion, just giving you a heads up. If you don't wanna hear any, any of this stuff, go ahead and skip maybe to a couple seconds, you know, because it is gonna get intense right now. <sighs> That's how intense it is because. So, Tommy ended up in the home of the Darn Dean family. And he shot 13 year old Keith Darning point black in the head when he broke into the house and before before cutting off before or after he shot him you know point blank in the head he ended up cutting off and mutilating his penis he then proceeded to bludgeon to death oh my god i'm not trying to cry here fuck three-year-old peter darndy to death with a hammer while he was asleep. This is where it's gonna get more intense, so if I cry, I'm sorry. His final victim, Elaine Darndy, who was seven months pregnant, sorry, who was seven months pregnant at the time, she was also bludgeoned to death by a baseball hat. And the attack on her was so, was so brutal that the shock forced Elena's body to go into early labor. So she had her baby. And once she was dead and Tommy saw that the baby was born, he also ended up beating the baby to death. So after he was done beating both of them to death, he ended up shoving the bat inside Elena's deceased body, then cleaning up a bit and putting both their bodies in bed like if nothing happened, tucking them in together. He then took out the bat out of Helena and just bolted out of there. Sorry, like I said, it was an intense, tense, <laughs> intense part. So then he was sentenced once again to prison. Let me clear my eyes because, oh my God. I'm sorry, like I said, that was a really intense part. Like, that got to me. <laughs> he was then sentenced to prison again for car theft. This motherfucker gets <sighs> sent to prison a lot for death, but hasn't been caught for murder, and it just coils me, and it's... Oh. <sighs> Breathe. 
So during his sentence, Tommy was diagnosed with a personality disorder which consisted of antisocial disorder, sus substance abuse, alcohol abuse, and bipolar disorder. And during his prison time, he ended up getting married to a woman named Nora Price. I don't know how the fuck that happened that he ended up marrying Miss Nora Price, but it did. So then, Tommy was released in 1997, and him and Nora located to Tennessee and right off the bat obviously the marriage was just fucking trash he was hardly there he they weren't happy with each other and as he wasn't there you can already imagine he was up to his dumb shit he was doing his killing spray he would leave Nora there at the house alone and <sighs> some people speculate that Nora did know but she would just turn a blind eye because she would get that escape of not having him home so she didn't give a fuck and would, would just let him do it and just, like I said, turn a blind eye. And some people speculate that she honestly didn't know, you know, because, I mean, I don't want to be that person that says, how did you not know? How did you not know that your husband was doing this? How did you not know that your partner that you've been with is not, that he's been doing this and you haven't, not, like, you didn't have no clue. But, I mean, there are cases that the wife never knew, just like the wife never knew that there was another family or the wife never knew that there was another lover it's just, it applies to that same thing and so <sighs> soon happily i can say this um the end of tommy lynn's cells will soon come to an end because tommy ended up i don't know how the fuck he ended up again with the carnival with the fairs and he ended up joining the heart of america carnival and that's where he would you know basically just drive the the vehicles that move the big machinery machinery meaning like anything they needed to lift off the parts of the carnival or carne carnival carnival sorry would move, <laughs> would use that to move some of the parts or would just use would just move or drive around the main the main you know the main ride so with um with that, he would again go on, you know, driving around state to state, different cities, and he, his next destination ended up being my hometown, Dario, Texas, a border town on the Rio Grande located below the Amsterdam Reserve, and that's where he would be, you know, with that carnival, carnival, which that carnival only lasts here at the time. I think, I don't know if they still last that long, but um, at that time they would only last about eight days. And at that time, in, fe in late February of 1998, I was born, I was, no, I wasn't born yet. No, I wasn't, I wasn't born yet. I was born in June 98, not February, damn. So, and for in late February, of 1989 he met a girl or a lady he met a woman a 20 a 28 year old woman single mother a four jessica levery and and they happened to live in the area and this lady miss jessica was very she was wooed by tommy i don't know how the fuck she was wooed but she was wooed i'm not judging you girl so she was very fond and was wooed by Miss, Mr. Mr. Sells, Tommy Lee. And he did leave with the carnival after those eight days, but a few days after, I guess him and Jessica ended up trading, I don't know, email. Jessica was able to convince him to come back to Dario. And on March 31st, a few days before his wife, Nora, he was still married to Nora at this time. Keep in mind, he was still married. Um, Nora ended up having a baby in Arkansas, Arkansas, sorry, in Arkansas, and Tommy wasn't happy about it, he wasn't really excited about this whole baby thing, so he pretty much told Nora, like, hey, he gotta go, so Nora ended up, you know, having to give that baby up for adoption, and so she did, which, I mean, thank God, but... He ended up moving to a trailer with Nora 
after after they ended up giving up their child but i don't know yet if they oh yeah they did he, he they did they moved to they moved they she moved back with him to dario and they ended up moving to a trailer and later on um later on tommy ended up accepting a position with amigos auto sales in dario and that's where he became a salesman a car salesman and at the time um in 1980 1999 he made dario pretty much now his home like you know his main base his his main point of location so he was here for a minute he would do since he now he was a car salesman with that dealership he would tell his you know his wife well now it was how can i say this he was with nora and that girl jessica but i don't know if they were because he did marry jessica he didn't end up marrying jessica but i don't know if they were like into a you know marriage of three or maybe nora didn't give a fuck anymore and she was like do what you gotta do i don't care as long as i don't gotta give you shit and um so he would use his you know his job as a car salesman to tell you know nora or jessica that he had to go make a business deal somewhere else over a car or to buy a car for the because it was a, a used car lot and so he would have to tell them all the time like oh i have to go for business and check for this car or the customer over there wants to see a car or whatever and he would also también say that oh i'm gonna go visit visit family um visit visit family uh so and so so back to 1999 he he made his home his his home in dario like his main base because remember he never had a main location besides when he was younger you know now he had like a main base and home so obviously he couldn't he couldn't hunt here he couldn't couldn't attack here because obviously people would catch up or whatever and um he ended up on the, one of these business trips, he ended up uh, allegedly breaking into a 32-year-old woman's trailer in Gibson County, Tennessee, 75 miles northeast northeast of Memphis. And he stated that he killed the young woman by stabbing her to death and also killing her eight-year-old daughter. What a fucking piece of shit. I'm gonna like... I don't even want to hear it right now. But um, after that, he quickly made his way back to Texas and drive to San Antonio. And two weeks later, with a different carnival group for this huge fiesta celebration, they always have fiesta there in San Antonio. At 10 p.m., uh, a nine-year-old Maria Mary V. Perez vanished from her family, you know, because they went to go sit down at um, a table downtown called at the mercado and um they said that one they just turned for a second and they turned back to see her and she was gone and um sadly um on april the 18th mary's body was discovered 10 days later in a creek at san antonio and they stated i'm gonna cry again they said that she had been killed and also assaulted. <sighs> Jesus, I don't want to freaking cry. <sighs> so, after his, um, after some time, um, supposedly by this time, after that incident, the, the girl in San Antonio, there were some cases that said that he claimed that he also killed some other women, other children. I think two or more people. After that, um, his supervisor from Amigos Auto Sales here in Dario um, gave him, you know, extended his hand, invited him like, hey, I go to this church. Um, my church is called um, Grace Community Church. And he gave out like an invitation to Tommy, like, hey, you should come to Sunday service. Come with us, you know, it'll be great for you to have, you know, something positive like that in your life. If only he fucking knew. Um, so, um, sadly, that is where he meets his next victim. 
and there he met the Harris family. He, shit, sorry. That's where he met the Harris family. And um, they, they had uh, two daughters uh, that were the perfect age for that piece of shit. That, were, that, that was his, you know, that was his type. Young, vulnerable, and ch children. And um, after that, after meeting the family, he would kind of invite himself into the family by, he would stop by the house unannounced or call ahead of time like, hey, he wanted to talk to Terry Harris, who is a father, you know. He would always invite himself to the house, kind of asking Terry for men or men to, for marriage advice, you know. Since he got two fucking wives, how the fuck do I do it? He has two women in his life. And, um, but in reality, when he would go to the house, él nomás se lo pasaba, he would just stare at the two girls. And he would specifically stare at Katie. Katie, who was 12 years old at the time. So, on December 31st of 1999, so it was almost entering the new year of 2000, Tommy that night was filling up his truck and was getting ready for a road trip to Kansas. And on and on that day, he just like was like, fuck it. Family, the Harris family, happened to live on the way out of Dario. And um, he clearly saw that as an opportunity and he was like, I'm gonna fucking take it. Like, I'm gonna dip, leave. I'm gonna say I wasn't here, quote unquote, wasn't here for the crime. So he already knew, he was already planning that shit. He was like, I'm gonna take advantage of that. So, Tommy, Tommy ended up breaking into into the Harris's home, which was in Aquaya Bay at 4.30 in the morning. And before he did, there were some people, or he tried to get people like as witnesses because he stopped at a bar close by the home. And there was a bartender there that was like, yeah, I saw him there and he would just talk about how he liked it this way and he liked it that way, you know, bien mañoso. And um, she was just like over his shit and was, Finally, when it came to clothing town, she just said he stayed there until two, you know. After that, he said he was dipping, so I don't know. But he tried doing that. He tried getting someone there at the bar as his, as a witness. So, back to it. So, 4.30 in the morning, he broke into the Harris's home. And he made up, I mean, he made his way up to Terry's, Terry's daughter's room, Katie, who he initially, you know, that was his target. He wanted Katie. And um, <clears throat> I'm not trying to cry. Um, when he found her room, Tommy ended up kind of like crawling into her room because he didn't want to make any noise and wake up the family. And um, he ended up crawling into the room and crawling onto the bottom bunk that Kaylee, Katie was in. And he quickly covered her mouth and with his butcher, butcher knife, he proceeded to cut off her cut off her underwear grope her and rape her and katie she's such a strong person katie ended up wiggling herself out of his hold and was able to stand up and she just yelled go get mama and only then did tommy see that there was 10 year old crystal sorrels and she was a friend of the family. And at the time, she was 10 years, 10 years old and weighed about 80 pounds. And Crystal was half asleep. She was dozing in and out. So she, she clear as day was like, oh shit, what the fuck? Like, what's going on? So as, you know, Crystal got up, Tommy ended up, you know, turning on the bedside lamp. And that's where he saw Crystal. And he right away got behind Katie and he put his hand over Katie's mouth. And Crystal states that in that moment, she can see in Crystal's eyes, like, I mean, Kate, Crystal can see in Katie's eyes, like, don't do anything, don't move, don't breathe. Like, please, like, I guess, like, don't leave her alone in that moment. She didn't want to be by herself in that moment. That's totally understandable. And, um, and then in a snap of a second, Tommy ended up slicing 
or cutting Katie's throat twice and that she saw Katie's body just fall to the ground and she laid and as she lay there she was really she was making these horrible noises Katie was making these nasty gurgling noises and it was it was she said it, it was as if Katie was trying to gasp for air but the reason she was making the noise is because yeah she was she was trying to breathe but the blood was I guess kind of like she couldn't and and then Tommy this piece of shit um Tommy then continued to stab he continued to stab Katie and later on the coroner stated that there was a total of 16 stab wounds on her body and three of those stab wounds were so deep that they went through her torso After he was done with Katie, he he turned around to Crystal, who was pobrecita. She was still she was frozen in place. Like so, as Tommy saw her there frozen in place, he didn't even think about it twice. He just grabbed Crystal and slit her throat, and Crystal automatically just dropped to the floor motionless. He then proceeded to wipe down anything that he touched. So the bed, the girls, the lamp the way he fucking crawled, he wiped that shit down. And um, <clears throat> he quickly made his way to the, um, he quickly made his way to, to the window that he broke into. And once he was outside, he ended up popping off the telitas, the screens for the window. And um, all of them, you know, not only his, but he cleaned it down too. And he only, he did that to cover kind of like his tracks, um, kind of make it seem like it was the wind's fault for doing that. Which is like, come on, bitch. Like, but little did this motherfucker know that Crystal was still alive. She was pretending to play dead so he could leave, and obviously it worked. And once she heard the car moving, like outside, like driving away, she bolted up and ran outside the door, holding her throat. And once she got to a neighbor's house that was a quarter of a mile away, um, keep in mind at this time, every everyone else in the house she thought that they were slaughter off so she didn't even bother to check if there was anybody else in the house alive or anything she was just so scared that she just ran she just bolted and was like nope i gotta go and so <clears throat> the neighbor who was a retiree her bets was up early in the morning just you know enjoying retirement drinking his cup of coffee enjoying his um tv just chilling just enjoying his time when um all of a sudden he hears knocking knocking and half banging on his door and as he checks his peephole to his surprise he sees you know this little girl in a blood-stained t-shirt and boxer shorts and socks with her you know holding her throat and um god i just i can't imagine like his first thought seeing that like like, I'm, I'm pretty sure he was at shock seeing that. I'm pretty sure he was like, nah, like, this is not real. So, so she couldn't talk since her windpipe had been the thing that was cut. And if Tommy would have gone deeper cutting her throat, he would have honestly cut her car carotid ar artery. Artery. Her carotid artery. Uh, carotid artery. Sorry. Spanglish doesn't let me speak right. Her, it would have cut her carotid artery, making her, you know, bleed faster, not being able to do what she did. And after Mr. Betts calls the police, Crystal was, you know, doing hand signals and like, hey, give me something to write with. Like, like, let me tell you something. And, um, oh my God, I'll put it up. But she ended up writing on that note, on that crumpled bloodstained piece of paper. She ended up writing, the Harris family is hurt. Tell them to hurry. Will I survive? Neck up. I heard, like, I heard, like telling like my neck needs to be up. And as Mr. Betts is helping Crystal, he kept trying to soothe her to calm her down. And he said that he gave Crystal, you know, cariños, like vessels on her forehead, kisses on her forehead to soothe her. And he just kept reassuring her that she was gonna be okay. But Crystal, wouldn't believe him you know she felt that she was going to die on his kitchen floor and as the medics and the 
police finally arrived, um, Mr. Mr. Betts, um, Mr. Betts' home, um, they saw Crystal convulsing, like shock, like she was going into shock. Her body was going into shock, and um, after being rushed to the hospital in Dario, the you know they stabilized her as much as they could, and then ended up flying her out to the the university hospital in San Antonio. As you know, the university in San Antonio, that hospital there, was starting to work on Crystal. They were trying to, you know, they spent, they were trying to repair the damages that were done. And they spent many, I can't stop shaking. They spent about maybe close to six hours on Crystal trying to repair that five inch slash across her throat. Five inches. A lot of people think it's not a lot, but it is a lot. It's enough, girl. It's enough. But um, after that, the police were back at the Harris home. They ended up finding Katie's body, deceased body, but everyone else in the home were, you know, they were, they were not harmed, it was just Katie. So after investigating and seeing the Harris home, they stopped by with Crystal right after, you know, a couple, couple hours after her surgery. And she's very groggy. She's, you know, understandably exhausted, you know, what about everything went down in surgery. And <clears throat> they wanted to question her right away just because everything was fresh. It would be fresh in her mind. But they also knew that they didn't want to force her, you know, because they know what she went through. But Crystal, she's fucking champ. Um, Crystal, on the other hand, she was very fucking ready and ready, eager to catch this son of a bitch. And, um, she signaled for pen and paper and started describing her attacker and the way she <laughs> and the way i'm sorry i know it's not funny but the way she says it, it's funny and <laughs> so the way she described her attacker was pretty much a knockoff walmart brand looking as chuck norris <laughs> so when the police end up putting like um putting this stuff out there like his his picture and all that stuff the police did press put a lot of pressure and heat on the harris family because they 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 knew from the evidence seeing the home they saw right away that it wasn't a robbery it wasn't a break into steal stuff it was it, there was a motive it was a sexually motivated crime that person went in there to get what he wanted and he wanted katie you know and Sadly, he did get Katie and but Crystal wasn't in like it wasn't in the plans. Crystal wasn't in the plans for him um, Crystal's family the reason that Crystal was living or staying with the Harris's at the time was because Crystal's family and Katie's family They were friends before the Harris the Harris family moved to Dario. They actually were friends in Kansas and um, so the same opportunity came for Crystal's parents to move down to Dario. And so they were like, hey, is it cool she stays here? It's just because it's just a long ride, you know, coming back. So they took advantage of the fact that it was during the holidays. They were just trying to go back to Kansas to get what they needed and come back. So as soon as um, they got that call, you know, that heart singing call about what happened, they were maybe, I think, I, I would say more than six hours out of the drive and as soon as they got that call they fucking u-turned that shit and came back right away and when they were coming back um <clears throat> terry harris actually went you know terry the dad of the harris family the head of the household um he actually went along with um crystal's mom crystal's mom pam and her crystal stepdad um doug and as they were driving back they saw and heard the description of the person that attacked them and doug crystal's stepdad was reminded of the man who fit the description and he remembered um the man at the gas station just before they left for kansas remember do you remember tommy was trying to do that and he was trying to fill up his fucking truck tank to head to Kansas or anywhere to commit other crimes to do shit again. So they remember seeing this man at the gas station right before they left. And 
the same man's name came to his mind and it was he was like is it tom thomas theodore what and he's like no tom, tom, tom tommy he was like tommy and he remembered it being terry's you know terry's friend from church and doug claimed that he told texas ranger um john allen uh, about it and how the salesman that worked at amigos auto sales and so um ranger allen called the car lot you know the car lot owner and um he he ran it he ran it to him you know and he's like hey do you have anybody who fits a description and the owner he was very hesitant he was very hesitant and initially he refused to work with you know ranger ranger allen but soon soon he changed his mind and he gave the employee's name to a friend at the Valverde County Sheriff's Office. <sighs> I swear. You could have called Alan, but no. Anyways, so now the man's name, they know the man's name, <clears throat> and they ran it, you know, through the Texas Crime Database. And um, the man in the picture looked exactly like the man like the man in the in the drawing the only thing was that the man in the picture on his um on his photo when they arrested him he didn't have a beard so they were like fuck like it looks like them so they were like they were very like fuck is is crystal gonna know that that's him is crystal gonna see that they look alike you know so they were very very worried about that they really were hoping that crystal would see that they they do look alike and it's the same man so they ended up um <clears throat> so they took the the picture of that man that they found on the beta database that matched the name and not only with that but she the the the, the police also took six more of the pictures just to scramble them around to give her a good opportunity to see clearly and you know just to see if she can point him out and which she did identify her attacker who was the Dar dario used car salesman Tommy Lynn sells. On the 2nd of January, um, 2000, um, they went to Sell's residence where he shared it with his wife, Jessica, Jessica Levery, and her four children. And he went with the police willingly, and he didn't ask why they were taking him in. He didn't make a fast no hizo pedo. I guess he was used to it, you know, getting taken in or whatever. But <clears throat> um, Tommy... Um, ended up commenting to the Valverde County Sheriff's Lieutenant Larry Pope on the way to the sheriff's office. He was like, well, I guess we got a lot to talk about. There he ended up, um, there he ended up, um, talking about a life of killing and pretty much confessing to Chingles to many murders, as well as confessing to ki killing Kaylee, Katie Harris, and slicing Crystal's throat. You know, he would he didn't say her name, but he was like, "Yeah, I killed, I sliced um her little friend's throat too," not knowing that you know, Crystal fucking made it. And um, <clears throat> he also confessed to killing more than more women and children, and he confessed to killing a little girl in San Antonio. If you remember Mary B. Bettis? Um, he also confessed to that one. He stated that he killed more than 20 people all over the country for three fucking decades. Three fucking decades and nobody caught him doing that. They would only catch him for theft or robbery, which boils you because, ugh, I don't know, maybe at that time they wouldn't take, you know, fingerprints for anything, which they should because, like, god damn, I still wait that adentro afuera ese pinche pedo, like, fuck. Like... It just boils me that this could have been caught on early on if they would have just taken his fingerprints at an early time, you know? The the Ranger, um, Ranger Allen, um, he, he stated to Ranger Allen that the reason he is confessing is because he wants to put all that behind him, his life of killing, and that he just wants closure for himself and he wants to provide closure for the victims of the family. No, I feel like because he already knew it was about to go down, he knew like, yeah, I can't do like, I can't lie, you know. His court-appointed lawyer from Dario was attorney Victor Garcia, 
And Mr. Garcia claimed to give his client, Mr. Sells, Tommy Sells, um, advice to stop talking, to shut the fuck up, you know? And Tommy said that he did not want to shut the fuck up. He wanted all that shit to be over with. And um, his lawyer was still, he still would, you know, he was just doing his job. Don't give him hate. He was just doing a job, his job. And um, he he would still tell Tommy, like, hey, like, you need to stop. You need to stop talking. You shut up. But Tommy said, no, I will not stop talking. In fact, I also don't need a fucking lawyer. I would be like, okay, deuces. But I guess you can't do that. As a lawyer, you can't. Or at least as a court-appointed lawyer, you can't do that. There was also, which I don't understand the point of it. I don't understand why they even gave him the satisfaction because I don't know if they know or they knew that at the time, but if you take a murderer or a fucking psychopath that, a psychopath that did a crime back to the freaking place that they did their crime at or their murder, they find pleasure out of that. They reminisce on the memory of their fucking crime. So I don't understand why they did this, but there is a video of Tommy taking the police and pretty much showing them step by step how he broke into the Harris's home, which is like, it doesn't take a fucking genius how to break into a fucking trailer, you know? Like, it doesn't. It does not take a fucking genius. So it's like, I like I said, I don't see the point in the in the fucking video, but I'll go ahead and that, add that, add that here. So later on in 2000, the year 2000, he was put on trial for the murder in Darío and also for the attack on, you know, Crystal. And he entered a well thought out plea of guilty to the assault. And his attorney, Victor Garcia, um, trying to save his ass, tried showing the court that he is taking accountability for his action. He confessed that um, that you should take this into consideration. He quote unquote sort of turned himself in you know he didn't make it into this big ordeal and um <clears throat> but um the court after seeing you know after they saw and heard crystal's testimony the jury jury was split and after after they split and went to go you know decide um it didn't take them long in an hour i think we all pretty much know if the court or the jury dips and they come back within less than fucking three hours you're you're fucking toast like you know you're guilty and yeah they ended up saying that yeah he's guilty and um they chose they chose for him to get executed in the, the in livington texas where he would stay until his execute execu the date of his exec execution that's where he stayed where he stayed for the next 14 years, him complaining about how he doesn't have this, how he doesn't have that, that they treat him like shit in here, that um, he doesn't have enough soap to wash his ass or enough toothpaste to wash his fucking dirty mouth. Um, <clears throat> 14 years later, um, he finally was executed. And when they asked him what last words he would want to say, he just said, no, he didn't have any last words. So following this, after his execution, the family members who are who were affected by him, you know, who took away their loved ones, um, Katie's 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 dad and Crystal's family were were there, and it pissed me off how the new how the people who were like you know trying to get his feedback on whatever happened, and Uno, one of them. It occurs to him to ask him, do you think that Tommy Sells should have not suffered the way he did dying his execution? And I would always say this, when it comes to my kids, don't let it come to my kids. Because as a parent, if you're being told that or asked that fucking question, you deserve to get fucking socked in the throat. You, how, what kind of question is that? I would have been like, do you think the way that he murdered my child by slicing her throat and taking advantage of her, and you think that was the right way to take her out? No, obviously not, dumbass. But 
there he states that it took too fucking long for this to come to. He says that after this the execution, hopefully they could now move on even more after what happened. And another note, I don't want to call it out. I don't want to be that person, but I'm going to be that person. So when it came to little nine-year-old or 10-year-old uh, Mary B. Perez, who's a minority, who's a Hispanic girl, um, they give they didn't give her no time. They didn't ask her any questions. Mary B. Bettis's mother had a kind of like she knew that Katie's father was already like, dude, like, like stop asking questions, you know? So she she herself had to butt in because nobody was asking her questions at all. So she put in her statement that hopefully with all this I get peace, that my little girl's in peace, and que Dios que Dios canse en paz mi niña. And it just you see it they were not going to give her the time of day to to talk to them talk to her so that really got to me they did they i guess they didn't think that she was i guess interview worthy or anything like that and with crystal she's living her life she's married i don't know if she has family yet i hope she does you know i hope she finds comfort or peace um but i did see when i was doing my research that some piece of shit became obsessed with her and started, you know, stalking her and just trying to get into her life because of what happened to her. Don't do that. Don't be that loser. Don't. Like, what's wrong with you? Why would you do that? Leave her alone. But with that being said, thank you for coming back and seeing my video. And like I said, I'm not throwing, throwing shade to anybody from my hometown. I think that my community is a well put off community. We have our moments. I think every town has their moments. But other than that, it is, you know, a comfort, comfortable little town. But um, <clears throat> yeah, so with that being said, thank you for stopping by and be smart, be safe, and have fun. See you in the next one. <laughs>